Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here to the Dell Technologies Fireside Chat here at City Investment Research. My name is Jim Suva, and I am here specifically, I got to reorientate my item. Perfect. I'm here with uh, the Chief Financial Officer of Dell Technologies, Tom Sweet. Dell Technology statements that relate to future results and events are forward-looking statements and are based on Dell Technologies current expectations. Actual results and events in future periods may differ materially from those expressed or implied by these forward-looking statements. Because of the number of risks, uncertainties, and other factors, including those discussed in Dell Technologies periodic reports filed with SEC. Dell Technology assumes no obligation to update its forward-looking statements. We also know that City Investment Research has disclosures associated with this, and any subjects and any clients um, who are subject to MIFID II need to make sure that they have those agreements in place. No media or press are allowed on this. So first of all, this is Dell Technologies. Jim Suva here with Tom Sweet, the Chief Financial Officers of Dell. So Tom, as we kick things off, boy, I got to tell you, you know, person to person here, the events of 2019 and 2020 year to date, there's been a lot of changes, a lot of challenging situations for tech companies, including US, China tensions, tariffs, the pandemic related operational headwinds. Many companies are adjusting their business practices to become more nimble. What are your top priorities as chief financial officer for Dell right now? Well, thanks, Jim. And hey, it's good to see you. If, 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 only if it's just virtually, right? So it's too bad we couldn't do this in person, but I uh, appreciate you having me on today. So, well, it's clear there's been a lot going on in the environment this year as, uh, as we've navigated through the first, uh, you know, six to seven months of the year. I was I was mentioning to Michael Dell and, and Jeff Clark the other day that I said it feels like this first, you know, first couple of quarters of the year have taken about two years to get through so far. So it's been... Uh, it's been interesting to work our way through it. So, look, it's, uh, you know, like many of you, and we've been navigating through a, a work from home scenario and, you know, impacts to the daily life that, that all of our team members are going through. Um, but it, even as we do that, we're, we're clearly focused on how do we serve our customers? How do we ensure that we're providing the technology solutions that our customers need to drive their businesses? So right now, you know, Michael, Jeff, and I have been very focused on, again, helping our customers, making sure our employees are safe, but also thinking about how do we position the company for future growth? You know, what are, what are those growth tangents and vectors that we need to be focused on? You know, and so it's, and we, and we're taking the learnings from what we've learned so far as we've gone through this COVID uh, pandemic, you know, We've seen customers' behaviors change where they're now more, you know, willing to engage virtually. And how do you think about that in a post-COVID world? And how do you lever uh, capabilities to better serve our customers? You know, we've rolled out um, payment flexibility programs to help our customers who are, are navigating how do they preserve capital but still need access to technology. And so it's been a it's been a really interesting six months. And then we've also obviously had the, um, the, you know, the the whole George Floyd dynamic that we've had to work our way through around racial and social injustice. And how do we ensure that we're, we're, we're building a uh, continue to accelerate an inclusive culture? Having said all of that, I mean, you know, we're, we're extraordinarily focused on. You know, what are those future ready growth vectors that we ought to be focused, you know, that we're that that we look to as growth opportunities, areas like telco, areas like edge, areas like uh, data management, data services are all are all areas that we're investing in, even as we de-invest in other areas as we navigate the, 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 the dynamics. And also, you mentioned China, right? You know, China is a is a very big, important growth market uh, market for us. It's a it's a you know, our supply chain has a, has a number of operations there. You know, we're, we're obviously, you know, pro free trade and, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we can continue to work our way and that the governments can continue to work their way through, through that navigation and come to a constructive resolution. But we feel pretty good about our navigation to date, Jim. It's been an interesting half year. Uh, we're optimistic about the long term, but no, we have more work to do as we work our way through the next number of 
And Tom, you actually spoke on the topic um, a little bit earlier in your comments on the last question about capital allocation and cash. Can you remind investors about your debt pay down plans? You know, I think stock buyback, you kind of suspended it given the pandemic. Just walk us through your capital allocation and your priorities and strategic priorities for your use of cash. Yeah, you know, Jim, it's a, it's a question we get a lot. And, you know, we've been fairly consistent, I think very consistent in how we think about this, which is, hey, you know, from a, from a capital allocation perspective, we're very focused on debt pay down. You know, we've paid down three and a half billion dollars year to data as, as a Dell Technologies, um, you know, entity. We, we're scheduled to pay down another five and a half billion as we go through the remainder of the year. Um, all of all as we position the organization to get back to investment grade. You know, we just finished the, uh, you know, we just closed the RSA transaction here, you know, last week. And those proceeds will also go, go towards debt pay down. As part of that five and a half billion that we're going to do. So look, we, what's important for us, Jim, we, we think it's the right thing to do from an overall capital allocation perspective. You know, we did have a bit of a share buyback earlier in the year, but we suspended that just given the uncertainty in the demand environment and making sure that we position the organization properly. And we think it's important from, uh, just as you think about our scale and breadth of, of business that, you know, we get back to investment grade and, we're obviously having conversations with the rating agencies. It's going to be their decision on when that, when, when you cross that threshold and they make those calls. And it's our job to position the, the company appropriately to, 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 to drive that. So that's our navigation. That's what we're focused on. I'm pleased with the debt reduction to date. And we're just going to continue, you know, that framework as we move forward. Sounds great. How about if we shift it over now to kind of the, the core fundamentals of the business? Specifically, you and some of your competitors have talked about as a service models. How are you approaching as a service? What's your view on it over the long term? And is there any uh, uh, impact to say cash flows or something we should be modeling or changes to revenue outlook as you look at as a service model more? Yeah. Hey, Jim, uh, you know, it's a, uh... We, you know, I think what, what's been interesting as, as we've navigated through this pandemic is that there, there, there has been an increase in customer interest in these types of consumption models, whether it's as a service models or flexible consumption models or on demand models. But th those things that offer some variability in, in many instances take CapEx and make it into, change it into OpEx. And we've got a whole set of capabilities around our Dell technology on demand solutions that, um, that include both, you know, commitment based models like flex on demand or pay as you go or pay as you grow to, you know, to the various usage models as we've discussed. And so, you know, again, what we're focused on is how do we help our customers, uh, you know, uh, acquire technology and how can we help them in the way that they consume and pay for technology? And look, you know, we like it. I like these types of these frameworks. I think from a from a predictability of cash flow, from a, a long term relationship, from an overall profitability perspective, they're they're very you know they're very useful and, and good models for us. And so we're focused on how do we grow these as a service models. And so if you recall in Q2, I highlighted the fact that our recurring revenue, you know, which is a combination of utility as a service and some of the other financing models that we have grew 15% year over year to $6 billion a quarter. So you think about that, roughly 25% of our quarterly revenue is a recurring revenue framework. And, and we like that. We think it's, we're going to continue to focus on growing it. Uh, DFS is a key enabler of how do we drive that. And, uh, you know, so we're very, we're very, very focused on helping our customers, you know, you know drive these types of, of programs. So look, from a cash flow perspective, in terms of that question of how do you model it, you know, we have a pretty, you know, incredibly efficient capital structure. And so, you know, I think, you know, and we use DFS and we place debt against those DFS originations and financing receivables in, a, in quite an efficient way. So I think we feel good about our ability to continue to grow it. Customers are interested in it. And we're going to continue to push on this. And, and, you know, I think appropriately, you know, uh, 
from a profit, long-term profitability framework, we think is a really interesting proposition for us. Um, Tom, is literally a week ago or two when you and I were talking, as well as with your investors on your recent results. And I got to tell you, you know, they were very positive. You know, you upsided on, on almost all metrics. But your commentary on the future seemed, you know, almost like a yin and a yang, the opposite there of a lot more cautionary. So maybe can you discuss your outlook for demand trends? Because you just had a fantastic quarter amongst coronavirus, amongst a lot of business and retail and hospitality and restaurant, you know, wind downs or closures. And you had great results, but your outlook to me seemed pretty conservative or cautionary. Are you seeing something out there or walk us through your outlook for demand and how we should take your comments and kind of bridge it to just what stellar results you just had? Well, th- thanks, Jim. And, and I do appreciate those comments. And the team did, did do a good job of executing through Q2. You know, what, what I tried to convey in Q, as we talked on the, on the call a few weeks ago was, Hey, look, you know, the, the, the demand environment to date, you know, is a bit uncertain. And so we are focused on, you know, we, we want to be thoughtful about, you know, our commentary out there. And, and what I would remind you, Jim, what I reminded everybody on the call was, as you, as you look at our seasonal pattern for, for Dell Technologies, Q2 and Q4 are generally our strongest quarters. And, and Q1 and Q3 tend to be slight, slightly softer quarters. And traditionally, what we see in Q3 is, as you go from Q2 to Q3, we typically historically get a sort of a, a from a, a revenue perspective, sort of a flat to a minus 2% quarter on quarter demand or revenue dynamic. We do think it's going to be a bit softer this, this year. Obviously, we've got the, the economic uncertainty with the pandemic. We've got some mixed dynamics as we look at our client, our CSG business, where We've seen incredible growth and strength in government and education buying, and as um, as you and I have chatted about, and, but that comes typically with um, the, the the types of products they're buying are typically a lower ASP and a lower margin dollar product, and therefore you've got some mixed dynamics that are also have you know uh, sort of um, you know uh, playing into it. So, you know, my, my perspective was, look, I I I want to you know. With the lack of clarity around the demand, I wanted to make sure that we, we sort of set the framework, I think, the way that and shared with it, everybody the way we're thinking about it. You know, we've had a we, we're still optimistic, obviously, over the long run. We just think the next couple of quarters are going to be a bit of um, we're going to have some navigation to do as we work our way through this. And so, you know, I'm optimistic. Again, we've taken share, you know quite aggressively in, in storage, for instance, over the last couple of years, over 220 basis points. We've taken over 510 basis points of mainstream server revenue over the last three years. So, you know, we, we continue to consolidate, but yet, you know, I do think that, you know, we're going to have to, 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 to work our way through these, this uneven time over the next number of quarters. Um, Tom, you'd mentioned storage. You, you've been gaining a, a lot of share in storage. Maybe if you can talk a little bit more about looking more midterm, the pandemic, has it resulted in more needs? And maybe we can talk about both storage and servers together independently, more need for connectivity. You know, I, I know there's a side of the PC business, but maybe we can focus on servers and storage because you've been gaining share. Is yeah. there going to be pent up demand from this? Does it result in tailwinds or is it more difficult where if you ship something to Citigroup, there's nobody in our building to really accept and sign the delivery and install it into the cabinets, or at least those things are more complicated because there are people there to receive it. It's just a little more logistical, complicated than in the past. Can you talk about servers and storage in the pandemic and how we should think about you know, people using more data, more security, more connectivity, and how that should impact your servers and storage business? Yeah, look, it's uh, it's been an interesting time, uh, Jim. And again, you and I have chatted about this from time to time. You know, what we saw with customers was a behavior where they pivoted pretty dramatically to the end user devices in the first part of the year. And so, you know, our, you know, in, 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 in some instances, deferred, uh, you know, uh, investment in some of the infrastructure area. Having said that, we do think that, 
you know, there is an investment cycle that will, that is going to happen in, in the infrastructure space. If you looked at IDC uh, forecast for the, you know, for, for calendar 21, for instance, you would see that they're forecasting growth in both mainstream server revenue as well as in storage. And, and we do think there is a bit of a, there will be a, a bit of a pent up demand. I do think, uh, however, though, in the, in the next couple of quarters that we're still going to have to, to work our way through you know, uh, the, you know, the uneven and unevenness, uh, if you will, of the demand environment. You know, our, we've refreshed our entire product line and storage. You know, the receptivity has been quite strong. We're seeing pockets of growth in storage, for instance, in our, our power max, um, you know, our, our, our high end storage with our data protection um, offerings. Yet yeah, we still saw some softness in mid-range, and we're, we're optimistic that Power Store, the new mid-range product, is going to, to, to accelerate our, our our performance in the mid-range. And servers is is is, a, is an interesting you know dynamic as well. The server market has generally been a bit soft. Um, we've seen softness in the transactional demand, meaning that those smaller value um, transactions. We've seen, um, you know, the, the large bid business has continued to uh, hold up quite well. But again, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's very much a geographic dynamic in terms of, um, you know, where the, the pockets of strength are. We've seen growth in China, you know, the, the China market's growing, but yet the price points there have been pretty competitive. So we've been very deliberate there in what we do. So overall, the, the ISG space, the infrastructure space, it, it has been a bit uneven, but I, you know, over the long term, I think we're very bullish on what that looks like as customers continue to drive the hybrid cloud adoption that we're, that we're seeing. And, uh, you know, and so, but, you know, we're going to have to work our way through the, through the, through the demand environment and, and continue to focus on serving our customers. Uh, Tom, you actually touched on the, the product at PowerStore. If I remember right, I think it launched in May time period or yep. so. Can you kind of update us a little bit uh, on the launch of that? And does it have a meaningful impact on your ISG and any impact of margins? And the reason why I ask is sometimes when companies launch new products, there's a lot of promotion and advertising or discounting that goes on. Other times when people launch a new product, it's, it's a higher end, higher ASP of what's going in versus what's coming out. Or sometimes it's just simply you discount what the prior one was. So it's a net no change to the margins. How should we think about Power Store? Yeah, look, uh, Jim, I, we're we're very optimistic about Power Store, and you are right. It launched back in the May timeframe, and um, you know the receptivity by the customer base has been quite strong. Uh, we have seen uh, a strong growth in the pipeline of interest from customers in terms of the our our our, our, our sales pipeline, if you will. You know, but, but we've also been a bit, uh, we've been a bit slowed down, quite frankly, by the, 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 the pandemic in the sense of uh, many of our customers are not in the office. So therefore, when you think about a new uh, storage array with a new operating system and the, the work that most of our customers want to do in their labs to test it and qualify it, that's been a bit, um, you know, slower, if you will, in terms of working our way through some of the qualifications. But you know we're we're very optimistic. We think it's a great product. It's a dif- it's a differentiated product. Um, as you recall, and as you know, you know storage, the storage selling cycle tends to be a bit longer, right? And so one of the things that we're seeing is perhaps that that sales cycle is even a bit longer because of some of the qualification dynamics that I've uh, that I've highlighted to you. But there's a couple of things that we find pretty interesting, Jim. You know, we've been shipping for about a quarter now, right? And we've acquired uh, hundreds of new customers with uh, with Power Store. And what's been interesting is is that our, our hundreds of customers, I should say, with with our Power Store product and solution. What's been interesting is about 20% of those customers are either new to Dell or new to Dell Storage. And so it's been a a really interesting vehicle to begin to think about customer acquisition. Uh, and so we're very pleased with that. So look, I, um, we expect Power Store to continue to ramp as we go through the year in terms of how does it translate into revenue. 
Uh, but as we get to the to later half, later this year and on into next year, we 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 we're very optimistic about the um, you know the velocity that that power store will continue to drive. And, and you know, and customers are are are, are very favorable with what they're you know, their, their impressions of it. So, so far, so good, but, you know, there's, uh, there, we're, we're going to have to continue to, to make progress here. And Tom, sticking with the infrastructure market, you know, your margins were much, much stronger and, and richer than expected. And this was despite revenue pressures and inflationary environment where components cost a, a lot more in the first half of the year compared to past historically of when memory prices, you know, trail down. What's really driven the margin improvement? Because it just seems like the whole world would see margin compression, yet Dell saw margin, you know, better than expected, which is great. But I kind of also wonder not only what's driving it, is that kind of as good as it gets or is there still margin expansion opportunities? Yeah, look, um, you know, you did see um, operating margins, you know, clearly, um, you know, remain strong or, you know, uh, stayed up as we worked our way through the first half of the year. I would tell you that in many respects, we benefited or the operating margins benefited from the OPEX controls that we put in place. We talked about that in our Q1 call, Jim, if you recall, right, where we talked about the fact that we were limiting backfill, we were going to uh, you know, T and E, you know, as as most companies, you know, there's not much of that going on now. You know, we limited consultants and contractors. Uh, we suspended our 401k match. All hard decisions and tough decisions, but we thought appropriate decisions to protect the P and L and protect the liquidity of the company, particularly given the uncertainty in the demand environment. And so that um, that OPEX control. Um, obviously benefited the p and l we saw it in q one and again in q two you know and it, you know so I think in the inter, in the immediate that's that's clearly been helpful. Some other trends that I'd highlight for you though Jim, as we think about mix of product and mix of uh, you know uh, of, of the various solutions is you know we we have seen growth in our high value um, workloads and, and in those servers that um, that, that, that customers buy for AI, ML type capabilities, and they tend to carry a higher ASP, uh, which generally translates into higher margins. So we've seen good, you know, positive trends there as well. Uh, you know, we're also very focused on, you know, some of the as a service and recurring revenue, which are carry a higher margin dynamic as well. So there's a number of trends that are working their way through the, through the business. But, you know, I think what, you know, what we're navigating right now, what we're very much focused on is how do we drive and sustain margins at the same point in time, expand those areas that customers are saying are, 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 are focus areas for them. He has a service offerings, you know, the, the, some of the new storage solution capabilities, which carry a nice margin with it. So it's a mix of, uh, of areas, Jim, for, to, to be honest, but i um, very pleased with, um, you know, the result to date. And I think the team's done a really nice job of, uh, uh, of sort of navigating the environment to help our customers. Um, we haven't PCs to the later half of our discussion here because I often find myself reminding investors that Dell has a more outsized exposure to commercial PCs versus consumers. If I'm correct. So, you know, going back to school is, is a little bit disproportionate favor as opposed to returning back to work. So are you, am I still right on that as far as a lot more exposure to com, com, uh, commercial versus consumer? And are you expecting the, the trends to you know, improve going forward as economies start to off, start to come back to employees coming back to work or what's your, 
view on the PC sector and Dell's positioning. Yeah, hey, Jim. Um, uh, you know, look, I, I do think you're correct in the sense of if you think about the long term dynamic, we're very much focused on the commercial PC. We think that's where the profit pool is. You know, the fact that we have a direct selling organization allows us to do the attach motion to attach services, cross sell. So all of that uh, platform, the commercial PC platform is a very stable and profitable business for us uh, and, and generates really nice cash flow. There obviously are some dynamics that we're, we've had to work our way through as we've um, as we as we've come through the pandemic. We saw strong corporate PC growth in, in Q1, principally the notebook, the desktop clearly suffered as, as, as customers moved to mobility products. We saw that uh, softness, um, um, you know, uh, uh, continue into Q2. We saw the corporate PC space soften in Q2, but yet we saw the acceleration of government and education as we worked our way through uh, Q2. And we also saw the acceleration of the consumer space to your comment around learn from home. And so we saw really good growth in our consumer business. Uh, our consumer direct online, for instance, was up 79% year over year. Um, and, and so as we move now into Q3, as, as we've talked about on the call, we, we, we continue to see some of the mixed dynamics in the PC space where um, education and government continue to remain strong in the, in the PC space and the consumer space, uh, you know, remains, uh, you know, quite strong. We do think over time the corporate PC bounces back. And, um, you know, we, and that is the area of focus or in the longer term that's of interest to us given the profitability profile. But the reality is, is that you can't control the market and you need to take advantage of the market opportunities that are there. And to date, you know, you look at government and education, <coughs> excuse me, which are quite strong. And we're going to push on those as well as take advantage and, and serve our consumer customers, uh, principally consumer, you know, through our direct selling motion, which we think is, uh, you know, is uh, is quite strong, quite strong and, and very beneficial. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how the rest of the, the year, you know, works, works its way out. But long term, we're optimistic about the corporate PC. Uh, but clearly lots of uh, short term or intermediate demand in the in the education space and in the consumer space at this point. I imagine the component costs are a large feature also. So maybe can you give us our your first of all, walk us through when memory prices go up or down. And I'm sure it has to do with magnitude of the slope. Is it like a one quarter delay or does it hit you or help you right away? Do you pass all that? through or some of it through and, and again it depends upon the, the magnitude of up or down of those components can you walk through investors about how that impacts Dell's margins of components and kind of what you kind of expect going forward for component pricing yeah I'm happy to Jim and, and you know that there's a couple of product lines um, uh, that are quite sensitive to component cost changes right our PC space and in the server space tends to be quite sensitive and let me remind everybody that last year we saw unprecedented deflation, if you will, in the component cost. And from a Dell model, let me remind everybody that, you know, one, we, we don't carry as, you know, our inventory positioning is given that word direct selling organization tends to be less. So therefore, in a, in a component cost deflation environment, that tends to be quite beneficial from a margin perspective, which is what we saw last year with our PC and servers, you know, you know, in memory costs were, were quite deflationary. They flipped to inflationary this year and were inflationary in Q2. And so in, in that type of model, what tends to happen is, is that, um, you know, that, you know, you've got to price the memory and therefore it tends to be a, a suppressant on operating margin. Um, until you can adjust pricing appropriately. And so that dynamic continues to be one that, you know, continues to, you know, year over year was, was, was a bit of a challenge. As we look forward, you know, as we talked about on the call, Q2 
Q2 was inflationary, and we think Q3 would be slightly inflationary, but it, but we then think that memory flips to deflationary in Q4. And we talked about that on the call, given the demand environment that we're seeing. So, you know, our, and so what, what do we do about that? Well, it's all about how do you adjust your pricing and how do you adjust configuration strategies to ensure that when you're providing customers with the configurations that they need, but we're optimizing margins to the extent that we can. And as, um, as we talk, when we make a list price adjustment, we tend to realize about, you know, roughly 50 to 60% of that list price adjustment in any given quarter, just given the float around quotes and things of that sort. So, you know, that's the dynamic we're in right now. And, you know, component cost is, you know, as I said, are for both our servers and, and PCs are, you know, those are the two, two um, principal areas that where we see sensitivity. Great. Um, in the near term, are there any other component things? I think you'd mentioned memory the most. Is there anything else like some constraints on shortage of CPUs? Jim, I'm having a hard time hearing you, but if I if I heard the question properly, uh, Tom, please or. Uh, Yeah, Tom. Can you hear? I, Jim, I can try that again, please. Great. So, um, we should keep an eye on. I recall last year, I think it was CPUs were a little bit of a challenge. Um, I know a lot of displays. I bought more monitors for my house so we could host this call. Are there any other components we should keep an eye on? Because, you know, mostly you mentioned memory. Yeah. Hey, Jim, right now, I mean, and it shouldn't be a, a surprise to anybody, given the demand that we've seen with um, education and with uh, notebooks and with Chromebooks, that some of those low, low core count CPUs are in short supply. And so that you've seen that um, as, and that has manifested itself in sort of long lead times as you look out at, some of those types of product offerings. In addition to the, the, the CPUs, also the, um, some of the, uh, the monitor or the flat panels for the, the, the Chromebooks and for the education notebooks are, are, are a bit in short supply. So there are some constraints on the low end, but absent that, um, you know, I think the, the, the overall supply chain's in, in pretty good shape and, you know, lead times are generally in line. Uh, and we'll have to work our way through the um, through the education and Chromebook bulge that we have right now. But you know, other than that, I think we're in good shape, Jim. And um, CPUs, um, is it fair to say you're getting all you need now, or are there like allocations? I remember last year, I think there were some constraints on CPUs for Dell. Is that right? There were, Jim, and you know, we, you know, we were, we're working quite closely with Intel on, in terms of total, not only quantity, but also sort of the mix, which types of CPUs. And, and there, there still are some dynamics there. Um, we're working very closely with Intel, you know, daily on, you know, our CPU requirements and, and the types of CPUs. And so that continues to be a, a, a an ongoing, um, uh, uh, set of activities and work that we're doing, but you know, it's our job to work our way through it and to, 
um, you know, to ensure that we provide the right platforms and, and have the right, cap- you know, solutions for our customers. So, you know, still a still a bit of a constraint, but uh, we're working through it. Hey, Tom, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. And uh, I got a couple more questions here. Um, you know, it, I don't think it would be fair for us not to talk a little bit about you. You mentioned a SEC filing earlier um, that you filed about the potential spin or tax spin of VMware. Um, I don't expect you to give us an update on that because, you know, I'm a licensed CPA and I know you have to get um, IRS approval. There's a lot of, you know, things you have to do, commercial agreements and put in place that But can you just kind of walk us through the logic? Because for years, Michael Dell was so much talking about stronger being together. Just walk us through kind of the the logics. Hey, Jim, uh, fair question, right? And so, look, I I think that, uh, you know, what we've we've thought about there is that. Tom, it's Jim Suba. Can you hear me? Yeah, Jim, can you hear me now? Jim? Hey, yes. hey, hey, Tom. Yeah, Tom. Tom, Tom before you yeah, answer Tom, that question, uh, we're talking over each other here. Apologize. Hey, Tom, before you answer that question, hey, Jim, you're breaking up pretty bad. We might suggest that you turn off your video and just go audio only for the rest of the interview, and we'll see how that works. And Tom, I think you got the gist of Jim's question. I, I did. I just um, – and I'm happy to answer it. Uh, and Jim, uh, you, you have broken up, but I think I, I got your gist of the question around VMware. So let me uh, give you some thoughts on that, and hopefully we, we you'll be able to hear me uh, effectively. So, look, I, I think as we've thought about it, you know, we, we don't think that the market is appropriately valuing our structure. And, you know, we've said that on, on, on a number of occasions. And, and um, we obviously stay are, are very much focused on value creation. And so we we have been thinking our way through alternatives that can maintain some of the, the benefits of our current relationship with VMware while unlocking some of the uh, respective you know equity holders and benefits for each of the companies. So you know a potential pathway here is this uh, you know potential uh, tax free spin of 81% of our interest in VMware to to Dow stockholders. And so, you know, having said that, so, you know, that was the, that resulted in a 13D filing in mid-July. We are continuing to work our way through that and that, you know, we'll have to see if that comes to fruition or if that makes sense. But we do think there's benefits to both the Dell technology shareholders and the VMware shareholders if we could, you know, do the, do the tax free spend while maintaining uh, through a, a, a strong, a good operating agreement, some of the benefits that that we've articulated around the better together, the joint innovation, and the uh, the, the, the coordinated go to market, and we have uh, both Dell Tech and VMware have work streams that are focused on working our way through some of these questions to see if there's a way to to, to do this in a way that uh, that makes sense, you know, and, and as part of this, we we would consider. How do you think about uh, a special dividend from VMware to VMware shareholders as, as part of this construct as well? So lots lots of work going on. We'll have to see if this comes to fruition. Um, but we do think that uh, there's an opportunity here to optimize 
uh, the strength of the relationship and um, you know what we bring from from Dell, what Dell brings from a go to market strategy from a from a, a hardware innovation and as well as VMware from their capabilities as well as the DFS uh, capabilities that we bring to bear. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we're exploring this. We'll see if it, you know, if it comes. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Obviously, the earliest we could do this would be September of next year. Uh, but right now, we're focused on, you know, thinking our way through and working our way through some of the areas that that we would need to resolve. So, more to come at the appropriate time. And Tom, as we wrap up now, last few minutes, is there anything you want to communicate? to investors that either they're overlooking or the top question or, you know, two that you want to clarify as we conclude? Yeah, look, uh, Jim, thanks. And I appreciate you you giving me a second here. So look, I, I, I think the, the question we get a lot is how do you think about um, the, the, the near term growth and how do you position the organization to grow in some, particularly with some of the end user markets, you know, we're very uh, focused on if we, as we look out over the intermediate, the opportunity in front of us, we, we participate in these markets that have, you know, very large uh, total addressable market opportunities. We have, although we're the leader in, you know, mainstream servers, we're the leader in external storage, we're the leader in commercial PC profitability. You know, there there's opportunity yet to continue to consolidate the market. You know, there's as we look at growth vectors, you know, some of the new adjacent TAMs that are emerging or whether that's in telco, whether that's in edge, whether that's in data management, data services, I think also provide some interesting opportunities for us to, to think about growth. Uh, you know, we're going to have to navigate the intermediate or the short term, if you will, with the, with the COVID dynamic, um, but we're optimistic uh, that the technology trends are in our favor, right? If you think about the adoption of hybrid as sort of the, the operating model that most that organizations are migrating to, which is so there, there's there's a role for both public, uh, um, you know, public cloud as well as on-prem and private cloud. So we believe the world's coming our way, Jim. You know, you know, we've got work to do and we've got to continue to build our capabilities and serve our customers. But uh, we're very optimistic. Uh, given the state, you know, our business framework, given the, you know, our strong cash flow generation capabilities. And, you know, we're focused on, um, you know, paying down debt, getting back to investment grade and continuing to, to serve our customers. That sounds great. Tom, I want to thank you and your management team for joining us. And we wish you a, a nice, healthy time here. And we look forward to seeing you again in the not too distant future. Thanks so much, Tom Sweet, Chief Financial Officer of Dell Technologies. Thanks, Jim.